want to appear, then just switch it off. Um, so the format is I'm going to introduce uh, today's speaker. Um, and she's going to speak for about 45, 50 minutes, and then there'll be an opportunity to uh, ask some questions, um, make any, any comments, relevant co comments, um, and I'll come back and tell people online how they can do that um, if you're not familiar with Teams, just a little bit later. Okay, so uh, I think if we're ready to, to start. I'll, I'll introduce today's speaker. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to invite uh, back to Queen's, um, uh, Dr. Cleona O'Galher. Uh, Cleona is uh, a lecturer in the School of English and Digital Humanities at University College Cork, uh, and she's a specialist in um, romantic writing. Her critical introduction to Mariah Edgeworth was published just earlier this year in 2021 by Edward Everett Root as part of uh, that publisher's new Key Irish Women Writers series. And her other recent publications include an article on Edgeworth and Robinson Crusoe for the European Romantic Review in 2020, uh, Essays in the Golden Thread, Irish Women Playwrights, 1716 to 2016, with Liverpool, Liverpool University Press, also this year, and a, in Irish Literature in Translation, uh, 1700 to 1870, uh, published last year by, by Cambridge. She's the author of uh, a monograph, uh, Mariah Edgeworth, Women, Enlightenment and Nation, published by UCD Press in 2005, and the co-editor with Heather Ing Ingman uh, of A History of Modern Irish Women's Writing, uh, published by Cambridge in 2018. So it's a great pleasure for me to uh, uh, introduce to you uh, Cleona, who's going to speak to us about a, a topic uh, related to uh, her research on Mariah Edgeworth. And the title is Harry Ormond of No Town, the local, the transnational, and the imperial in Edgeworth's Ireland. So, Claire, I'll just move the microphone over to you. Perfect, thank you. And get you on camera. Thanks, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Give everyone a wave there. Um, so, firstly, the book is actually just about to come out. Uh, the physical copies, I think, like will exist next month. There's going to be a launch in, in Edgeworth's town, I think, which I'm quite excited about, at the end of November. Um, so, the the material that I'm presenting today is comes out of the project of writing a new critical introduction to the work of Mariah Edgeworth that, that Peter just described. Um, but it's not like a chapter from the book. <clears throat> it's more kind of ideas that were provoked by the experience of, and the very welcome experience of re-encountering many Edgeworth works that I hadn't had the occasion to reflect on uh, in recent years. So one of these, as the title of my talk would suggest, is a novel that I have always had um, in a very simple way, a huge deal of affection for, uh, namely Ormond, which was published first in 1817, uh, together with Harrington in the immediate aftermath of the death of Richard Lovell Edgeworth. Now, I don't want to completely ignore Harrington uh, because there's a lot that you could say about it, but I don't have time here. It's a very neglected text. But strangely, Ormond is only slightly less neglected. This is in spite of its status as the last, but hardly the least of Edgeworth's Irish tales and its reputation with those in the know at any rate as um, a strong contender for her most aesthetically successful novel. Ormond shares with Ennui and the absentee the project of imagining what legitimate leadership in Ireland could look like. But the legitimacy that is conferred on Harry Ormond involves an incorporation of the traditional values and aspirations of the Gaelic and Catholic population in a much more pronounced manner than in her earlier Irish tales. This shift is accompanied by a marked development in her fictional technique as she moves away somewhat, kind of qualifying that, from the allegorical romance structure um, that is a characteristic of her earlier Irish tales focusing instead on Harry's relationship with King Corny of the Black Islands and the creation of a more nuanced, credible and quote unquote rounded character that had heretofore been seen in her novels. The key event in this relationship is not a marriage, but Corny's funeral in which the private and public dimensions of Harry's relationship with Corny are united mm -hmm. and which functions both to establish Harry's legitimacy as Corny's successor and the legitimacy and visibility of Catholic Ireland. The novel also departs from the conventional travel narrative that is integral to both Ennui and the absentee, but the spatial logic that is characteristic of the national tale is present in a somewhat altered form. Instead of being on a tour in the way that both Glenthorne and Columba are, 
Ormond is, to use a modern cliche, on a journey. The various locations he experiences are closely linked to moral growth and the development of his character. But at the same time, they also represent different types of um, social uh, formation and societal development. Uh, thus offering Edgeworth's own model, not only for how the past gives way to the present and the future, but also for how different understandings of the past and of history can overlap and coexist. Departing the quasi-feudal Black Islands, where he has been integrated within Gaelic and Catholic, Catholic networks, Ormond experiences the elegance and sophistication of Ancien Régime Paris, where his manners, but not his morals, are refined and polished, and he learns to balance cosmopolitanism and patriotism. These distinct locations thus effectively produce the perfect Irish gentleman, ideally equipped to assume a leadership role. But for Ormond to transform from his orphan status as Harry Ormond of no town to that of an estated gentleman, Edgeworth introduces another location, India, which is the source of the wealth that ultimately enables him to purchase the estate for which he is now fitted. As I said, the critical literature on Ormond remains very sparse, so it's perhaps not surprising that there is no critical discussion of this aspect of the novel. But it is in stark contrast to the extensive critical debate around Edgeworth's representations of the West Indies and West Indian slavery in both The Grateful Negro uh, and Belinda. This aspect of Edgeworth's criticism, I had a very nice slide here with lots of different book covers, <laughs> reflects the surge in interest in the imperial and colonial dimensions of British culture in the Romantic period that took off in the 1990s, with key publications such as Alan Richardson and Sonia Hofkosch's Romanticism, Race and Imperial Culture, Sarie MacDesey's Romantic Imperialism, and Nigel Least's British Romantic Writers and the East. On the specific topic of slavery and abolitionism, the eight volume collection, Slavery, Ab Abolition and Emancipation, Writings of the British Romantic Period, edited by Peter Kitson and Debbie Lee and published in 2000, gave researchers access to a wealth of material that was previously scattered and hard to locate. Thus, it's not surprising that Edgeworth's engagements with West Indian slavery and planter culture have been such a focus of critical attention. Um, but it makes it somewhat surprising that her references to India and Britain's expanding imperial interest in India remain relatively ignored, particularly in terms of how depictions of India relate to her representations of Ireland. Now, obviously, this is an area that is clearly now growing uh, in terms of interest. So we can think, for instance, of Julia Wright's uh, Ireland, India and Nationalism in 19th century literature, published in 2007, which discusses Edgeworth alongside work by Lady Morgan, Thomas Moore and Charles Maturin. Um, however, there is no mention of Ormond um, uh, in, in Wright's work. And there are also some very curious omissions uh, in her discussion of ennui that I'll come to later. Uh, more recently, Sonia Lauritsen has contributed a very interesting discussion of Edgeworth's, another popular tale of Edgeworth's Murad the Unlucky, uh, to the collection Ireland's Imperial Connections, to the collection Ireland's Imperial Collections 1775 to 1947, edited by Geoffrey Wright and Daniel Roberts. And Ashley Cohen's very recent work on the interconnected nature of the East and West Indies in the imagined imperial geography of the Romantic period includes a discussion of both the Grateful Negro and Lane Jervis um, in her book published in 2021, The Global Indies. But again, aside from a passing reference to ennui, Cohen does not engage at all with Edward's work outside of the popular tales. In spite of this, both Wright and Cohen agree, as do many other critics, um, Greenfield, Bulukos, Kirkpatrick and so on, who've written on Belinda and the Grateful Negro, that Edward's Anglo-Irish background and concerns can be seen to inform her awareness of how colonial labour, resources and opportunities underpinned social and economic reality in Britain and Ireland. And conversely, that her representations of colonial spaces can inform and afford insight into her representations of Ireland. Given that, it seems to me to be worth asking how we can read Ormond's incorporation of imperial wealth from India into the construction of Edward's ideal of legitimate and socially responsible leadership in Ireland. And in order to do that, I want to first address some of the other or the other texts in which India appears in her work, beginning with the earliest and certainly the most extensive uh, of these, Lane Jervis. Uh, so Lane Jervis was published in uh, 1804 uh, as one of the popular tales, uh, probably the most widely discussed, uh, aside from The Grateful Negro. 
And in a short preface by Richard Lovell Edgeworth, these are described as being written with a view to addressing the lives and interests of the majority of the estimated 80,000 readers in Britain, the 70,000 who are not among the nobility, clergy or gentlemen of the learned professions. <clears throat> The explicit address to middling or lower class readers has been questioned by Ashley Cohen, who points to the relatively expensive format in which they were published. They have 15 shillings for three volumes, I gather, obviously, which is very different from very cheaply produced work. But stylistically, the popular tales do share similarities with the fiction produced, for example, by Hannah Moore in the cheap repository tracts in that there are self-conscious allusions to the traditional preferences of lower class readers for fiction that departs from the limitations of the everyday and promises total transformation. But while censuring delusive and dangerous fantasies, it is clearly suggested that there is a right way to achieve change. In the story of the exemplary Gray family in Rosanna, for example, whose success is the result of hard work and cooperation, the narrator remarks that, quote, Goodwill is almost as expeditious and effectual as Aladdin's lamp. The promise of social mobility and the acquisition of wealth by apparently realistic and legitimate means is nowhere as vividly represented as in Lane Jervis. Beginning life as a destitute and orphaned child labourer in a Cornish tin mine, Jervis gradually advances through the time-honoured triad of intelligence, hard work and honesty, but the rewards for his sterling qualities are dependent on the intervention of a benevolent master who effectively liberates him from the tin mine and provides him with his initial education and opportunities. The kind of uh, the emphasis on gradualism, which is important uh, to this the project in the popular tales, however, starts to disintegrate when Jervis, who is by now employed as a demonstrator by a traveling science lecturer, is after, offered a position at Andrew Bell's educational institution in Madras, which operated under the auspices of the East India Company. Edgeworth makes clear in a lengthy footnote that a pamphlet entitled An Experiment in Education Made at the Male Asylum in Madras is in fact her main textual source for the Indian sections of the narrative. Jervis's removal from England to India, even when underwritten by this exemplary model, appears to create the conditions for an extraordinary series of adventures when Jervis is requested to make a visit to Tipu Sultan, who is of course a historical figure, in order to make a series of scientific demonstrations. This we are assured is granted in fact, in that one William Smith did carry out these demonstrations in actuality for Tipu Sultan, and this is included within the uh, pamphlet that she cites. Although it is not recorded what direction William Smith's life took after this, in Jervis's case, the invitation acts as the kind of magical device that Edgeworth's emphasis on gradualism and the reward of effort initially precluded. Jervis's expertise and hard work win him the Sultan's favour with the result that he is ultimately made manager of the Sultan's diamond mines at Golconda, where he uses up-to-date machinery for the further exploitation of mines that have been abandoned, thus bringing increased profits. Jervis's acquisition of wealth explained in rational terms to his audience of listeners. He's telling the story of his life somewhat in the kind of inspirational kind of, you know, you can do it too manner. He digresses, in fact, to explain to his former mining colleagues the benefits of his decision to live frugally in order to invest his salary and increase his savings through compound interest. That's very Hannah Moore, like explaining how interest works and stuff like that. In spite of these rationalized explanations, however, Jervis's trajectory is in truth a transformation worthy of any fairy tale or oriental tale. Beginning life as the lowliest worker in a Cornish tin mine, we leave him having gained a fortune as the master of a diamond mine in India. The tale, moreover, concludes with an appropriately gripping finish in which the hero is thrown into prison on the orders of the Sultan, who's been tricked by a scheming merchant into believing that Jervis has defrauded him. He's dramatically rescued by his former pupil, the Sultan's enlightened son, Abdul Kali, and a loyal servant named Saheb. Now, we know that Lame Jervis was completed in 1799. As Ashley Cohen points out, this means that it was written simultaneously with Edward's unpublished essay of the education of the poor. This essay was uh, in part a response to the 1798 rebellion and to Edward's father, Richard Lovell Edward's ultimately unsuccessful attempts to introduce a bill in the Irish parliament providing for a system of popular education. 
The fact that Edgeworth's chief source for Lame Jervis concerns a colonial experiment in education lends weight to Cohen's argument that, quote, in popular tales, Edgeworth's preoccupation with geographically portable pedagogy is transmuted into a transnational program of progressive labor management. Planters, mine owners, and overseers take the place of educators as the classroom is replaced by the workplace as the primary site for the formation of the kind of subject nation she envisions in on the education of the poor. Cohen, in fact, links Ireland, Cornwall, India, and the West Indies of the Grateful Negro, arguing that, quote, Edgeworth derives a counter-revolutionary formula to stem the global Jacobin crisis of worker disaffection, a formula applicable among slaves in the colonies and wage laborers in Britain. In Edgeworth's rendering, the two populations are hardly distinguishable from one another. Cohen's claim is, I think, justified by the extraordinary transformation that Jervis undergoes, in which his early life as a child laborer is mirrored later in the lives of enslaved workers in the diamond mine. In these scenes, Jervis is now the manager of labor, putting into practice the enlightened and effective principles he had learned from his own benefactor. In spite of predictable depictions of quote unquote Indian despotism and corruption that reinforce the intellectual superiority and civility of the British characters, the dizzying exchange of positions that Jervis experiences could be said to dissolve these distinctions, equating the experiences of desperately poor workers in both locations. On one level, Lame Jervis offers non-elite readers the possibility of achieving their social and material goals by exploiting the opportunities that the empire affords to white settlers and migrants. But in its enthusiastic exploration of the empire as a means for struggling Britons to achieve an otherwise elusive social mobility, it also ultimately reveals the similarly oppressive conditions that operate at the lowest rung of the ladder in both Britain and India. So Lane Jervis obviously offers a very particular model of how Ireland, Britain and India interact um, and how there are similarities and differences uh, between uh, the social classes in both locations. But I'm going to move on now to discuss uh, another text, um, Little Dominic. So although less extensively represented, India is actually critical to the plot in Little Dominic. And it's an inset tale in an essay on Irish bulls. I wasn't sure like how many Edgeworth experts versus non-experts I'd have in the room. Um, so just to let you know, an essay on Irish bulls is a, it's a very polyphonic text full of different um, sections, different voices, different styles. Uh, and Little Dominic is kind of unusual in that it's a kind of a self-contained story uh, within what is largely like an essay format. Now, Judy Wright has argued for the for significant structural and thematic similarities between Little jo Dominic and the other tale I've just finished discussing, Lame Jervis. And she argues this through their what she claims is their similar use of the trope of fostering. In both tales, she points out, quote, Edwards begins with a suffering child and ends with a well-to-do worker grateful to his British mentors and patrons. The suffering child in Little Dominic is a young boy sent away from home in Ireland to school in Wales, where he is relentlessly mocked for his Irish accent by his fellow pupils and, quote, flogged every morning by his master, not for his vices, but for his vicious constructions. Dominic's isolation and the cruelty and irrational violence that he experiences from the other boys and the schoolmaster are conveyed powerfully, giving the short tale a genuinely affecting quality. You know, if you're softy, like, you know, obviously not if you're a callous, hard-hearted person. It offers an individual, emotionally charged perspective on the theme of the volume as a whole, which is the unjust arrogance and ignorance that underpin British stereotypes of Ireland and the Irish. An essay on Irish bulls is unquestionably the most trenchant and passionate critique of British attitudes to Ireland that we find in Edgeworth's work. And certain passages very accurately skewer English exceptionalism and the absolute conviction of superiority that goes along with it. Given that these features of English nationalism were central to the ideological justification for domination over Ireland and other colonial territories, it's interesting that little Dominic concludes by framing Irish participation in the imperial project as a means to redress imbalances of power, 
wealth and influence within the uneven and uneasy union of Great Britain and Ireland. With the help of Edwards, the one boy in the school who does not participate in the universal mockery of his speech and who is described as his English protector, Dominic is spared the vicious scapegoating of the schoolmaster and advances in his studies and his assimilation to English norms. This enables him to acquire a position as a private secretary to a highly placed military leader. And after a period spent in India, where he becomes known as the reputed author of a much admired pamphlet on Indian affairs, he returns to Ireland with enough money to enable him to buy the estate that had formerly belonged to his family and to live independently. And with sufficient money and social capital to return the kindness of his old school friend, Edwards, who through the misfortunes of his father has found himself in debtor's prison. Irish Bulls is a text in which there is at times palpable anger in relation to the injustice with which Ireland has been treated by England. Motivated at least in part by the ongoing reprisals against suspected United Irish rebels and the deliberate stoking of prejudice in the run up to the vote on the Act of Union. It is therefore interesting that nonetheless Edgeworth proposes that it may still be possible to imagine the Ireland-England relationship as a relationship of reciprocity and goodwill. The realisation of that fully reciprocal relationship, however, in this case, requires assimilation with English norms and the assumption of what Wright called, quote, a proximity to Englishness withheld from other colonial populations. Little Dominic shows that this proximity to Englishness involves assuming the position of power over subordinated populations, such as those in India. Now, in her book, Wright goes on to link her discussion of how colonial fostering operates in Lame Jervis and Little Dominic with the 1809 Irish tale Ennui, arguing with this trope of fostering in mind that the Scottish agent MacLeod, who was sort of like an Adam Smith stand in, and Glenthorne's mentor, Lord Y, uh, who's usually read as a tribute uh, to Lord Charlemont, uh, he was like a patriot leader, can be read, so what she argues is they can be read as the paternal fosterers who help Glenthorne to acquire the skills and moral growth that eventually equip him to assume ownership of the Glenthorne estate. Now, I don't find that argument particularly compelling, I have to say. But what is more surprising is that Wright does not discuss the ways in which India is actually present in the novel, rather than just in the form of an analogical echo. India is present in Ennui in a way that clearly recalls its function in Little Dominic. And I suggest that it develops further the sense of a specifically Irish involvement in the Indian imperial project. So again, not sure how many of you are devoted fans and I mean, I know someone is very familiar with Ennui, but anyway, an aspect of the novel that has sometimes troubled, indeed annoyed readers, is the disappearance from it of Lady Geraldine, a forceful and attractive character with whom our hero, Glenthorne, falls in love, but who rejects him in favour of the literary and intellectual Cecil Devereux. Lady Geraldine not only bears a resonant name, she is, in fact, a passionate Irish patriot. And thus it is understandable that Robert Tracy, in an article that has had perhaps a disproportionate impact on subsequent readings of Ennui, interprets the narrative rejection of a marriage between her and Glenthorne as a refusal ultimately to embrace and valorise native traditions and native leadership. So the Geraldine's obviously representing a, a really significant family with a long tradition uh, of leadership. You know, and Edward Fitzgerald being the most recent kind of luminary uh, of the family. Tracy refers to her as being shunted off. But for the purposes of this paper, it is certainly significant that she and her beloved Deborah are shunted off to India. Deborah is talented, but without means, which is what has prevented his being able to propose. When Glenthorne realizes that his proposal was rejected because of this pre-existing attachment, he digs deep into his better nature and puts pressure on the influential Lord O'Toole to grant Deborah a vacant appointment in the British administration in India. Now, Deborah's character is well developed and his appointment in India is portrayed as more than being just a conveniently well remunerated position, introduced only for reasons of plot management. 
He is, for instance, an enthusiast for the works of the renowned Orientalist Sir William Jones. He reads Jones's poetry aloud for the assembled company, and he also assiduously studies Oriental languages, including Persian, which was a language in which Jones obviously was particularly proficient and had translated from. Neither he nor Geraldine, in fact, disappear once they leave Ireland for India. We are told explicitly that they correspond with Glen Torrance, so that the relationship is uh, maintained. But even more important than that, we again are told that the willingness of the venerable Lord Y to act as Glenthorne's mentor once he has disinherited himself is as a result of Devereux's recommendation. So if we look closely at the Indian subplot of Ennui, what we see is a reflection of the emergence of the kinds of Irish imperial networks that Barry Crosby, for instance, has described. Having exerted his influence with Lord O'Toole as a landowner with control of electoral boroughs in order to gain the Indian appointment, then himself as an aspirant professional after being disinherited, Glenthorne then benefits from the network he has helped to establish. He records that his friendship and correspondence with Devra, who is acquainted with, quote, almost all the men of eminence at the Irish bar, enables him to develop both a social life and invaluable professional contacts. The incorporation of Irish participation in the imperial project in India could thus be argued to be materially related to the portrayal of Glen Glenthorne's transformation from decadent aristocrat to professionalized and responsible landlord. Now the novel, as we know, keeps several balls in the air at once, not least of them the question of authenticity and origins. So again, it could be a massive spoiler alert, but Glenthorne learns to his great astonishment that Eleanor O'Donoghue is not his foster mother, but his mother, and that he is by birth part of the Gaelic Catholic tenant class. But his voluntary relinquishing of his wrongly inherited wealth and position isn't an embrace of his origins, but a device to present him with a blank slate where he can then remake himself, you know, in a completely new kind of mold. As many commentators have noted, this enables Edgeworth to have her cake and eat it too. The man who ultimately takes over the Glenthorne estate is both a Catholic peasant and an exemplary British professional. It is through Eleanor that Edgeworth infuses into her novel the Gaelic and Catholic perspective. It is from her that Glenthorne first hears history, including the history of his own family, as it is remembered and recorded by the Gaelic Irish. Quote, the times of the old kings of Ireland, long and long before the Glenthorns stooped to be lorded, when their names, which it was a pity and a murder and moreover a burning shame to change, was O'Shocknessy. Thus Glenthorne is woven into the Gaelic history of Ireland, but his rebirth as a model professional ensures that in addition to respecting the traditional loyalties and concerns of his tenants and labourers, he will manage the estate according to modern principles. So, Ghost of Adam Smith, which are not at all dissimilar from those practiced by Jervis's benevolent master and ultimately by Jervis himself. And as we have seen, the process of his professionalization is clearly linked to Irish participation in Britain's expanding empire in India. So this brings me finally to the last section of my talk to Ormond. As I stated at the outset, this is a novel even more concerned than either Ennui or the absentee with acknowledging the existence of and legitimizing the perspective of the Catholic population of Ireland. And it involves the creation of Edgeworth's most charming and attractive hero. Well, this is in my view, obviously. And well, that's what she clearly was intending herself. And his transformation from a ruthless orphan to this ideal estated gentleman. Transformations are not unusual in Edgeworth's fiction in general. And as we've seen, they're certainly characteristic of these texts that I've discussed in which India also features. Now, clearly, Ormond's transformation could not be achieved without the substantial fortune he inherits from India. But I will suggest in the final section of this paper that Ormond, in fact, represents a radical departure from the model hitherto seen in which Irish participation in imperial expansion in India is either explicitly or symbolically linked to reform and progress in Ireland, with implications for how we read the novel's vision of the Irish communities it represents. Now, Ormond was inspired by a suggestion made to Edgeworth by Etienne Dumont, uh, who wanted her to write a sequel to professional education, in which she described how a young man might overcome a faulty education. 
Instead, Edgeworth took up this idea for a novel, creating the character of Harry Ormond, the son of a Captain Ormond who married imprudently and then abandoned his wife and infant son to seek his fortune in India. So Harry is taken from the cabin. It's significant, I think, that he's in a cabin in which he was being nursed and is brought up at Castle Hermitage by his guardian, Sir Eunuch O'Shane, who sees, quote, no use in giving Harry Ormond the education of an estated gentleman when he was not likely to have an estate. Harry is introduced to the reader at the opening of the novel at a dramatic moment in his early life when his hot temper and lack of restraint have resulted in the near fatal wounding of an innocent man. His inherent good nature is, however, as apparent as his faults. He immediately takes full responsibility for his actions and his concern for the unfortunate victim of his anger and genuine remorse lead him to recognize his own weaknesses and mistakes. And the incident therefore becomes for him the start of a process of moral development. This moral crisis initiates a journey that is literal as well as symbolic, indicating the novel's investment in place as an index of values and ideas. Although Sir Ulick feels genuine affection for his ward, self-interest is his dominant trait. And in an effort to promote a match between his son, Marcus, and the young, beautiful, and not at all uh, impoverished Florence and Ali, and he finds it convenient to remove Ormond from Castle Hermitage, and he's therefore sent to the Black Islands to live with Sir Ulick's cousin, Cornelius, better known as King Corney. Now, the primary moral development that Harry experiences in the Black I Islands is his capacity for emotional attachment. Corney's capacity for uncalculated emotional generosity is in stark contrast to Sir Ulick's self-interest, and it provokes an unshakable response of loyalty, uh, love and respect from Harry. Assuming the role of adoptive father towards him, Corney dubs him Prince Harry, indicating that the relationship of affection and feeling between them also confers on Ormond a public role as his legitimate successor. The relationship thus established is intriguing, not least because unlike Sir Ulick, whose family had converted to Protestantism, Corney is a Catholic and regards himself as a guardian of traditional ways and customs in his miniature kingdom. The explicit depiction of these sectarian differences is a striking departure for Edgeworth, who otherwise almost always chooses not to label or cat categorize her characters according to their specific religious faiths. The denomination of Harry as Corny's successor is based to a large extent on the quality of their personal relationship. And in fact, the sincerity of mutual affection is the basis on which Ormond is recognized as a successor to Corny by the Black Islands community. The novel, however, does not ignore the fact that religious and ethnic identities in Ireland had political dimensions and proposes um, a sophisticated understanding of this question in that personal relationships also require the negotiation of public and social ritual. And this is exemplified by the ways in which Ormond pays his final respects to Corney after his death. The explicit way in which Edgeworth highlights the observance of Gaelic and Catholic rituals by a member of the Anglican Church of Ireland is highly unusual in her fiction. Now, as you do all know, with Anglicanism as the established church, while the majority population remained Catholic, religious affiliation and its attendant practices were politicized and continued to act as potential sites of conflict and tension. But Edgeworth chooses to focus on precisely these practices suggesting that public ritual is a valid and important demonstration of personal feeling. In Ormond's case, the rituals associated with Corney's death and burial, the wake, the Catholic requ requiem mass, and the funeral cry as the procession makes its way to the graveyard, are represented as being in tension with his own feelings, but his participation in these rituals is nonetheless depicted as an essential mark of love and respect. When Corney's housekeeper, Sheila, sees him shudder at the seemingly inappropriate festivity of the wake, she acknowledges his distress, but encourages him to, quote, bear with it for the sake of the community for whom it is a vital ritual. The intersection between appropriate public performance and feeling is moreover underlined when Sheila's ex explanation of aspects as a funeral mass to enable him to do his duty correctly is recognized by Ormond as, quote, real kindness. The real kindness that prepares Ormond to participate in rituals that are in many ways foreign to him, but which he recognizes nonetheless as essential, is a significant departure from the modernization narrative with which Edgeworth has sometimes been associated. 
Although she was consistently and explicitly expo opposed to conversion attempts and proselytism, which is represented in Ormond by the odious Mrs. McCruel, the ways in which wakes and the keen or funeral cry are represented elsewhere in her work, notably in Castle Rackrent, could be seen in terms of the characterization of Gaelic culture as archaic and therefore it's incompatible with social and economic progress. In Ormond, however, the observance of these rituals is depicted as an appropriate public demonstration of the close personal relationship between Harry and Corney. By naming religious difference in a way she had not before, Edgeworth makes the Catholic community visible and confers legitimacy on their religious and cultural practices. The novel's 1770 setting does not diminish the clear contemporary political resonance that these scenes possess. I have dwelt on the importance of Corney's funeral at some length because it offers a stark contrast to how news of other deaths in Ormond's family are treated not long after these emotionally charged scenes. Returning to stay at the rectory at Castle Hermitage, Ormond finds himself anxiously dependent on Sir Ulick's efforts to secure him an army commission, and evidently this is not at the top of Sir Ulick's priority list, until news arrives that dramatically changes Ormond's prospects and outlook. As we can see, I did have a slide, but you'll just have to listen to the quotation, sorry. The news is delivered by Sir Ulick in a manner fully consistent with his callous indifference to anything outside his own interests. This, however, doesn't, I think, really diminish the cold and frankly offensive way in which he describes the death of Ormond's stepmother and half brother in India. He explains that he wants to, or he says, I, I want to explain simply, sir, that you are possessed or soon will be possessed of, but come sit down quietly and in good, good earnest, let me explain to you. You know your father's second wife, the Indian woman, the governor's mahogany colored daughter. She had a prodigious fortune, which my poor friend, your father chose when dying to settle upon her and her Indian son, leaving you nothing but what he could not take from you, the little paternal estate of 300 pounds a year. Well, it has pleased heaven to take your mahogany colored stepmother and your Indian brother out of this world. Both carried off within a few days of each other by a fever of the country, much regretted, I dare say, in the Bombay Gazette by all who knew them. So this is pretty shocking stuff. And he goes on to justify his callous marker manner by remarking that as neither you nor I had that honor of knowing them. We are not upon this occasion called upon for any further hypocrisy, further than a black coat, which I have ordered for you at my tailor's. And then he goes on to give in a lot more detail how he has replied to this letter and particularly where to just transmit the property, which on the Indian mother and brother's demise falls by the will of the late Captain Ormond to his European son, Harry Ormond Esquire. The jarring quality of this announcement is amplified by Ormond's inability to respond to his guardian's enthusiastic questions about what horses and carriages he might buy, responding, I declare, sir, I don't know yet. My poor head is in such a state and horses happen not to be uppermost. But his explanation as to why his head is in a state actually reinforces the profoundly uncomfortable insertion and repudiation of Ormond's Indian family. He says that since he last saw Sir Ulick, he has, quote, suffered not a little. And he explains this by reminding him that he has, quote, lost an excellent friend, King Corney. Ormond cannot participate in Sir Ulick's, Ulick's emotionally bankrupt celebrations over the deaths of his, quote, unquote, mahogany colored relations. But the contrast between his capacity for feeling and his depth as a character is linked to his relationship to Corney. And this capacity does not extend to his stepmother and half brother of whose deaths he has just learned and whose race and color are repeatedly emphasized by Sir Ulick. I'm nearly there now, sort of about page and a half. The reduction of Ormond's Indian connections to a transfer of wealth and property is in sharp contrast to the formative developments associated both with the Black Islands and with Ormond's time in Paris. 
As already noted, Ormond is seen as representing a development in Edgeworth's style, which would be further developed in Helen, published in 1834, in terms of her creation of less emblematic and more naturalistically drawn rounded characters. However, that is not to say that the novel does not display any of Edgeworth's characteristic techniques, one of which is the incorporation of an incredibly wide variety of different linguistic registers, print sources and styles of representation. This aspect of her work was highlighted by Marilyn Butler, particularly in the long introduction to the Penguin edition of Castle Rack Rent and Ennui, and in her 2001 article, Edgeworth's Ireland, History, Popular Culture and Secret Codes. And I kind of echoed uh, Butler's title in my own because I think Ormond offers very rich examples of this technique. Most strikingly, as a novel, Ormond incorporates the largely oral culture and heritage of the Black Islands and the highly sophisticated Salon culture of pre-revolutionary France, in both of which locations Ormond is depicted as being entirely comfortable. In Paris, he is admired for his perfect command of French and his ability to carry off the fashionable outfits of a French gentleman. His disability is contrasted with the apparent kind of gormlessness of the average English gentleman. And in addition to visits to the theatre, entertainments and even gambling, he makes the acquaintance of philosophers and intellectual leaders, including D'Alembert, Marmontel and Marivaux. His time in Paris gives him considerable social polish and a cosmopolitan perspective, and it also proves to him that he can withstand tempting but dangerous pleasures, such as the possibility of an affair with the now married Dora O'Shane. At the same time as she creates her character through, a through scenes of ballrooms, salons and theatres, and through moral dilemmas very particular to the European social elite, Edgeworth also inserts them into an entirely different narrative tradition, that of the oral popular culture of Ireland. In this oral communal narrative, Ormond is constructed as a hero through feats of physical prowess that link him to figures of Gaelic myth. Quote, his glories of horsemanship and sportsmanship the birds that he shot and the fish that he caught and the leaps that he took are to this hour recorded in the, in the tradition of the inhabitants of the Black Islands. In this context, in which profound local attachments and cosmopolitan social and intellectual perspectives combine to produce the ideal Irish gentleman, it is striking that the imperial networks that had been portrayed in earlier texts as playing a vital role in the formation of characters such as Jervis, Dominic and Glen Thorne are conspicuously minimized and deprived of relevance other than in terms of the crude capital they create. So in conclusion, this is a very preliminary conclusion, you know, this is definitely a work in progress. Ormond imagines legitimate leadership in Ireland as requiring both identification with and acceptance by the majority population and embeds its concept of political legitimacy in a European and enlightened context. However, in what I argue is a departure for Edgeworth, this emphasis on a unified imagined national community in Ireland involves the repudiation of Ireland's place within the expanding sphere of British imperialism, implying a corresponding construction of Ireland as explicitly white. Sure, yeah. Pass the microphone over, Will. Uh, yeah. Get yourself and everyone else um, uh, seeable and hearable. Thank you very much, uh, Clean for that, that really fascinating paper um, on, on Mariah Edgeworth. Um, so we have an opportunity now to uh, uh, have some, some questions uh, and responses. So uh, obviously some people in the room, those of you uh, are online with Teams, um, there's a, there should be an icon on your screen uh, with a little hand and a face on it. If you click on that and click on the hand, that should just indicate that you want to ask a question. Um, and then I'll just invite you to unmute yourself um, when I see that. So um, let's start off. Anyone in the room want to, want to start? Any questions? Sean? Sure. No, I was going to go ahead and read a lot more on the The topic of the Indian period is that it's a very ambiguous place in the British uh, and in the Irish like mentioned. Yeah. An awful lot of changes as the time. We're getting the whole debate about the legitimacy of the Jackson in India. Yeah. Uh, for example, the war and the Hastings trial. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and you're getting that great cultural shift 
where a lot of people like William Jones who admire um, you know, Indian culture are uh, being displaced by the Grand Holy, who see the Indians as the Indian model of one white Christian land. Yep. And you know, we've been finished by the concept of whiteness. Yep. But of course, it's not entirely clear that the Indians aren't white in a way that, say, Africans aren't white. Um, you know, the racial theory is sure. the place as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, where the Indians sit in the racial heart. Yeah. So it's, oh, yeah. What we're not now is that you know, Mason gets played in uh, various roles in mm-hmm. fiction. She's dealing with a very plastic concept. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a really good point. Um, and I think, for instance, I mean, I didn't have time to mention this, but, uh, you know, Lane Jervis, and I'm, sh- you know, I'm sure other people in the room might have some comments on this, kind of represents the, the imperial connections between Britain, Ireland and India as basically, you know, opportunities for, um, for, for commerce, uh, for, for, you know, and he uses the word clean hands when he comes home from India. He claims that he has acquired all this wealth uh, and been left with clean hands. So uh, she's very keen to avoid the idea of, say, commerce being morally tainted by um, by slavery, for instance, uh, or by other forms of corruption. So Lame Jervis is a story in which, you know, using this one very slim textual source, right, um, she constructs a vision of you know a possibility of how you know the empire might function you know to, to to the rising tide that would lift all the boats and so on yeah so it's of course it, it's fiction it's it's not history um and there were other versions and i think in Anwy, for instance i didn't go into this but when um glenn thorne who at the time is still an aristocrat with control of electoral boroughs goes to this lord to put pressure on them to get the appointment there is this whiff of corruption about it because Lord um, O'Toole is, is not an upstanding, fabulous character. Like uh, he's he's very much what she calls a courtier. She tends to use that phrase. I mean, he's a member basically of, of the government um, and he uh, he doles out favours in a way that suits him. And he only does this favour because he's being pressured. Um, and there's something there, I think, that, you know, she obviously wasn't very comfortable with. So, I, you know, in terms of, say, um, Burke and Sheridan's, um, you know, condemnation of Martin Hastings and that whole aspect of uh, people being aware that the empire could actually introduce into British life, you know, um, sources of corruption. I think that is that is very much a concern. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I, I obviously I'm not an expert in British Imperial India, and neither neither was Edgeworth. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, there's just a very profound difference. And also in terms of whether Indians, how they're racially categorized, I think what's just so interesting there is how offensively emphatic Ulick is about the color of these people, and that that is clearly why he says that they don't merit uh, the mourning. Um, other than the, the ordering of the black coat. Okay, thanks, Sean. Uh, Daniel, over to you. Oh. Hello, hello. Uh, Hi, Daniel. Daniel. Um, that was a terrific um, uh, thing of um, uh, Indian um, uh, points in, um, through uh, Edward's um, oeuvre. Um, and I guess the question, um, I, I thought the, the links between class and uh, race and so on very, were very interesting. Um, my, I, was, I have maybe a somewhat peripheral question, but I was thinking about Ormond and uh, his education, which, as you mentioned, has a kind, he has to kind of uh, slough off his, um, you know, uh, the sort of more frivolous aspects of his nature um and that that involves also um uh, kind of uh, an engagement with french culture to quite a lot of it quite quite a significant extent mm-hmm. and i wonder if you saw um any resonance here with um the fact that you know britain was a you know uh, in uh, um was was um uh, 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 at, uh, you know in in, in uh, competition with with France there and this is part of a kind of uh, assertion of also of imperial 
uh, rivalry to some extent. This is the this is um, whereas uh, the French Tipu, Tipu Sultan in particular is very much associated with his uh, connection with France. So mm -hmm. he was so the, he, he's 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 in favor of France um, and a kind of model of uh, British colonialism, which is which is somehow at its best represented as being more robust, more honest, or whatever, uh, more legitimate somehow yes. than the French version. Yes. Would kind of uh, do you think that's connected at all to the, the French and the Indian uh, sides of things? Yeah, well, I, I th yeah, thanks very much for, for bringing that up. There's nothing I like better than talking about France in, in Edgeworth. Um, the again, I think there's actually quite a dramatic change from from say Lane Jervis to Ormond, um, because yeah, I take your point about um, that in a sense the representation of Tipu Sultan and Lane Jervis sort of in a sense it, it creates this echo say say of France and of that kind of imperial rival or that kind of rivalry um, as great powers between Britain and France. But what again, what's really interesting about Ormond that I didn't have a chance to go into um, is that. Uh, you know, Edgeworth has always represented um, France as really significant. So not always entirely positively, but as really important for a variety of different reasons. And um, of course, we know that Ireland had a different relationship to France than England did. You know, like obviously the United Irishmen landed, you know, on the West Coast. And, you know, there was this moment of potential actually kind of revolutionary alliance between revolutionary France and Ireland. And of course, you know, I'm sure nobody needs me to tell them about, you know, other kind of longer histories of, you know, alliances and contacts between Ireland and France, um, including, for instance, the education of Catholic priests. And in Ormond, Lady Annali actually says to Ormond, you know, you should you should learn French. That's very important. Um, and she gives him books and she says, if you, you should find a local priest, he'll be able to teach you. So Lady and Ali is a Church of Ireland woman, um, but she knows that one of the sources of French influence in Ireland comes via the Catholic Church. So the, rep the positive representation of Paris in, in Ormond is compounded of a couple of different things. One is the kind of classic, you know, high enlightenment that Edgeworth was always kind of very into. Like she's very interested in French enlightenment as well as the Scottish enlightenment. But the other thing is it's also a valorization of specific kind of Irish Catholic contacts with France, which again is not hugely usual. Like it's, it's unusual, yeah. I think Sonia has a question. Done? Yes. I actually can't remember either. I think there's a French Is there a French engineer? Well, you know, but there is, there's a French engineer in um, like, like this is the other thing about you know Edwards was pretty kind of you know she, she wasn't waving her her union jack yeah. a huge amount because in in Madame de Fleury yeah is that maybe, maybe I'm there might be two there yeah there be could two. be two because in Madame de Fleury which is about it's about the French Revolution basically mm -hmm. you know the Fleurys are people who lose their estate during the French Revolution but they have these loyal tenants um, Basile and Victoire and I think it's Basile is the name of the guy. And um, he basically becomes a, a professional through his involvement with Napoleon's army. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, he ends up developing engineering skills because, you know, he he's kind of is clever and then he gets projects within Napoleon's army. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although the, the British and the Turkish armies are fighting the French army, she somehow has alignment of the French and British army. <laughs> <laughs> But I must go back and check with the French engineer and Lane Jervis. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just a microphone, and there's a really interesting parallel between Little Dominic and Harry Ormond. And I've never thought of it before, so I thought that'd be fascinating. I was thinking of your title, what's the title of the talk about? Harry Ormond of No Town. Of No Town. Yeah. In uh, Little Donna, mm. which kind of makes this side joke that Little Donna was born in Ireland and bred nowhere. 
Oh yeah. It, way. Yeah. But it's also that kind of idea of being bread and nowhere. It's a sort of rootlessness. I yeah. don't think it's a whole negative rootlessness. No, it's absolutely. Like yeah, totally. Because like okay. and this is where like, you know, like I was I was thinking to myself, oh my god, am I going to argue that Ormond is Burkean? Is that actually what I'm <laughs> was that what I'm arguing? But but it's 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 really not because first of all Harry Ormond is you know he gets adopted by lots of people he's not he doesn't none of this is is his by birth you know he gets integrated into these networks but he becomes sort of seamlessly because he has this you know that protein capacity is something a lot of our characters have so he has that capability to be kind of to become something um not to not to have been born something but to but to become it to quote someone to over rather bizarrely um but there's a line that is explicitly anti-Burke in, in Ormond, which is when he's in Paris and it's supposed to be in the 1770s before the outbreak of revolution and a character that he's with, he's actually, you know, this character called Black Connell, who's, you know, a, um, a dashing kind of officer from, you know, the Irish brigades. And they're going through their streets in, in to the streets in their carriage. And he's basically like, oh, la canaille, um, you know, referring to the, to the poor of Paris. And, the narrator makes an explicit remark, which is la canaille, a term equivalent to swinish multitude for which the French have since dearly paid. So, you know, she the attitude towards the poor, she kind of categorizes being similar to Burke's and, and that being part of the problem. Um, now, again, I'm sure Burke would rise up out of his grave and go, how dare you? Um, but yeah, she has an alpopidum there for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there isn't any one. Yeah, go ahead. Actually, perhaps I'll take a sure. down for a moment. Um, thank you very much, Jenna. Thinking of that triangle, um, Ireland, India, Britain. Mm. Um, India is clearly a colony. Mm. I just wonder, looking across characters in my age where it's writings, is there a kind of representative view a conceptualization of the relationship between Britain and Ireland. Is there a conceptualization of the, in in her work of that relationship? Yeah, or indeed in her mind. Um, well, so. well, you know, I think we'd have to get get out the the daggers at dawn here for that because I mean that's. Of course, there is a conceptualization of the relationship between England and Ireland in, in her work, um, and it's something that has proved very controversial. Um, so, you know, the extent to which, you know, so a lot has been discussed as to to, to what precise extent, you know, Edgeworth's, you know, quote unquote, supported union, um, and um, like her, the family, as I'm sure you know, came to Ireland in 1782, and her father is self-identified basically as a patriot in that kind of 1782 moment, which was actually about legislative independence and about um, improving Ireland, you know, about Irish leadership and the improvement of Ireland. And um, he initially, he didn't, he opposed the union, uh, but he ultimately uh, voted uh, in favour of it, um, you know, for a variety of, of complex reasons. And so there is a very complex balancing in her work of, um, uh, and you find that in an essay on Irish Bulls, for instance, a very complex interaction between, in a sense, acknowledging the very close relationships between Ireland and Britain, the necessary political relationships that exist, the positive potential of those relationships, but also the fundamentally mistaken view of Ireland that was held by Britain um, and the kind of the ignorance and stereotyping that went along with that. Um, so sometimes her work is very optimistic about what the potential of those relationships can be and the potential of Ireland, for instance, to flourish within the union. And she was very interested in Scotland. She knew, you know, she had a lot of intellectual contacts with Scotland and she knew how Scotland had um, had, you know, become uh, a much wealthier um, and um, much more advanced country in the context of the union uh, with England and Wales. But she also knew that the conditions in Ireland were actually very different and that you couldn't map one onto the other. So it's, it's, it's very, there isn't one conceptualization uh, that exists. It's, it's a very complex question, I think, in Edgeworth, yeah. 
Yeah. So people. Okay. Yeah. No, that's okay. I was really glad that those plot summaries did some work for somebody. Excellent. <laughs> Again, I mean, yeah, yeah, I would love if, you know, somebody might disagree with me, but I came to the conclusion when I was rereading Ormond for the purposes of, of the book that it is very different because of the way in which she pays such close attention to those rituals. Um, and also that he has to be instructed. You know, I think he's the, the fact that he's instructed by Sheila, you know, who in many ways, Sheila's almost a character that you could find in like Sydney Owens since the Wild Irish Girl, you know, the, the, the wise old medicine woman with her herbs and her knowledge of, you know, her, her, her lore, her inherited lore. And so he accepts instruction from her in, in how to behave. And I think there's a kind of a very much sense of cultural humility there mm -hmm. um, about this isn't my culture, but I know it's very important and I need to get this right. Um, and I think it's it is interesting as well that she she uses the word shudder, that he is genuinely quite sort of he's well outside of his comfort zone participating in these rituals, but um, but he knows that it's very important that he does them and that he does them right, um, and uh, she describes like um, she describes for instance wakes in Castle Rock Ranch, but very much in a comic. Um, mode because the guy actually isn't dead. He actually just wants to see what his wake might be like. And then she also gives sort of quasi anthropological accounts of, you know, the Willaloo or the funeral cry, which is again taken really seriously um, and, and very emotionally in Ormond. So there's a really different tone. So like, you know, some people would say that the kind of quasi anthropological or antiquarian, say, descriptions in Castle Rack Rent are not necessarily dismissive or undermining, but they certainly don't have that sense of emotional investment uh, that you find in Ormond um, and the seriousness with which it's taken. Um, so I, I, there does seem to me to be kind of a shift in a shift in tone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Clean, I, I have two questions. Okay, great. If I can ask them. So the first one is, um, I um, I have read some some Edgeworth, but not Ormond's. This is a new one, new one to me. Um, but I'm struck by the the year of publication, 1817. Yeah. So this is a year uh, when Daniel O'Connell has exploded onto the, mm. the centre stage of, of of Irish national politics. You know, he's fought his duel with Destair in 1815. He's kind of uh, you're constantly fighting in the in the public arena mm. with Robert Peel in 1816, 1817. Okay, that's So here we have a man a man of the Gaelic West, yeah. who's also educated in pre-revolutionary France. Yes. Um, who is in a sense? You <laughs> oh, know, the, I see where the, you're the, going with woman, this. The, the, the nightmare. The nightmare. <laughs> uh, so you know, it, it seems to me uh, again, not having read the novel, that. Is there is there possibility? Is, there, is is Mariah Edgeworth possibly creating an an Anglo Irish counter to, to O'Connell? O'Connell? You know, imagining you know what would be necessary to counter O'Connell? Yeah, you know that 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 <clears throat> I that sounds very plausible to me, Peter. Because um, I one of the other things I discovered when I was uh, doing the book was that um, the absentee, which was published in eighteen twelve. Um, Sorry now if this is a very long story, but The Absentee was originally supposed to be a stage play and she wrote it and she sent it to Sheridan and he returned it, he rejected it. Poor old Sheridan, he was very sick at the time and he was like, what are you doing bothering me with this crappy play? But, um, and he gave a whole load of, you know when somebody gives you too many explanations for why something does, isn't going to work, uh, like just pick one. But um, she said, with the present state of things in this country, uh, that basically that there would be a hostile reaction uh, in London, and I started to think to myself, she's writing this in 1811. What the hell was going on? What's the present state? And I discovered, you know, maybe you can back me up in this or correct my terminology. There was a whole controversy about the Catholic Convention and about taking votes. Um, yeah. Oh, right. Brilliant. Because I need I need more information on it. Um, 
so it was it was quite a significant moment in terms of Catholic organisation. So it, it wasn't, you know, what we think, what I think of, because, you know, I'm not a historian um, of the mass movement uh, of the 1820s. But nonetheless, it was certainly seen as hugely significant at the time. It caused a lot of controversy. There was this, what was this act, the Convention Act, where you weren't allowed to take a vote? So it was seen as almost a dangerous expression of democracy, that they were going to send delegates, weren't they, to the Catholic Convention in 1811. Um, and uh, she incorporates Count O'Halloran, who's a character in that, she's a, he's a Catholic antiquary. Um, uh, if you join up the dots, he sounds an awful lot like Charles O'Connor Jr., who was basically like a Catholic unionist. Um, and so I think her knowledge of sort of Catholic politics and what was going on was a lot more detailed than we're aware of. Um, and she, you know, it wasn't about, so in other words, back to your question, it wasn't about, um, oh, right, the union's done and dusted, this is the way things are. She was aware of the fact that the union was far from done and dusted, so that there was this kind of, the minute the union was passed, people were thinking about, you know, well, are we going to get, you know, Catholic emancipation? Like, and you know, she was, herself and her father were really disturbed and really disappointed that the promises kind of redress for, for Catholic grievances didn't follow in the, in the wake of the Act of Union. And so, yeah, I think she was keeping a really close eye on where Catholic politics was going. So it wouldn't surprise me if she was kind of aware of this. And you're right. How how could how could somebody as attractive as Harry Ormond is what it's going to take? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. Just, yeah. just no, it's very interesting. Approach. I'm really glad you mentioned um, that. The, the, the other question is uh, you mentioned um, in passing. It wasn't about Ormond. It's one of the, the earlier texts um, that uh, Mariah Edgeworth had been interpreted as writing in a, in a kind of counter revolutionary. Yeah. Um, mode. Um, and I was, I was just thinking that there's a recent monograph by Sujit Sivasundaram. Oh, I don't know. Um, it's it's only been published in the last couple of years. Um, I think it's called uh, Ruling the Waves. Uh, but it's a kind of global history of the British okay. Empire written very much through that uh, interpretive lens yeah. of, of counter revolution between the, the 1790s oh, okay. and the 1840s. Um, and he does discuss. I'm pretty sure he does discuss the Wellesley brothers. Okay. Obviously, as part of that moment, yeah. You know, uh, in in India, um, mm -hmm. well, the, the 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 destruction of of Tipu Sultan's yeah uh, regime in 1799 through yeah. you know to to uh, Lord Wellesley's period as as Governor General. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, do you think that's a fair? I mean, that seems quite a crude way of, of reading her. Yeah, like her I, 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 I don't like. And again, this is another kind of perennial kind of argument amongst people who are interested in Edgeworth is, you know, uh, progressive, liberal, reactionary, revolutionary, um, and uh, I, I think that counter-revolutionary isn't the right word to use about Edgeworth. Um, you know, she. You know, obviously she wasn't in favour of blood on the streets, but I doubt very many people were at the time. Um, and her, uh, when you read, for instance, like, so Cohen's reading of, of the education of the poor um, is, is is really quite a negative one, because it's as if it's it's a way to, to control and manage a population, when in fact she does see education as having kind of radical emancipatory potential so it's not just a control mechanism and this is where you know you know I, I wouldn't deny any similarity between say somebody like Hannah Moore who is counter-revolutionary but they but they are not identical and their at their attitudes uh, are, are not identical um because in fact she she doesn't want everyone to stay in their place you know she she what she only thinks society can improve if if people if people transform themselves through education, largely, you know, that's... Yeah, I was just wondering what was talking there, and then you think maybe that would be a good point to bring in Hankton, because Hankton is this novel that was published alongside Roman, mm. and Hankton is a novel where um, the young, he's a kind of young English chauvinist, basically, yeah. who falls yeah. in love with a Jewish girl, mm -hmm. and then that would have a really something scathing like moral critique of this English chauvinism mm. that this young yeah. man exhibits. Yeah. And I think there is certainly a critique in there, but speak, think of Daniel Hunt, there's a critique in there of that kind of ethno national any sort of ethno nationalist kind of whether England or indeed anywhere else again, little Donald, we have the strange figure of the Welsh. The Welsh yes. <laughs> Yeah, he's kinda of like a Welsh ethno nationalist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit harsh on the Welsh, like. <laughs> so then, I think in 
reading form of the role like Harrington definitely could not cause that's yeah this poverty kind of level. No, no, um, that's 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 very very interesting. Um, I hadn't thought about actually that how they might work together, but they but they do, and you're you're absolutely right in that. You know, he's cured not just of irrational prejudice, but of of a kind of a you know kind of Anglo an Anglo centric chauvinism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Thanks. Um, so we haven't heard much from anybody online recently. Does anyone have any questions out there in the ether? That you want to ask? Just press the little uh, hand icon if you do. It's a bit shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You don't have to if you don't want to. Just, yeah, no. uh, just don't want to, you know. You don't, I don't want to deny you the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, if you have one that you want to ask. Um, or if there's anyone else in the room who wants to ask anything, any other points? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we, we can just have a conversation. <laughs> uh, well, look, uh, um, thanks very much for everyone to, uh, for, to everyone who has who has joined this uh, this afternoon. It's been a really interesting discussion, um, uh, and uh, Cleana has has led us through in a very uh, skillful uh, and uh, insightful way um, through Mariah Edgeworth's uh, texts. Um, and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to reading the book. Sorry, I, I sort of jumped the gun a little bit and sort of said it was out, but it's out, it's out very, very soon. Very, very, very soon. soon. Yeah. Um, so can I ask uh, all of you both in the room and online, online people, if you want to unmute yourselves, uh, just to give uh, Kleena a round of applause and to thank her for today's presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for the invite and for the opportunity to, to have the discussion. It was great. Thank you all. Uh, Orban, honestly, it's, um, it's so good. I, I, should, I should just say, just, just before people disappear online, uh, we do have another seminar next Monday on 1st of November. Uh, it'll be uh, Shamima Akhtar from um, uh, Royal Holloway. Uh, University of London, who's going to talk about the representation of Ireland in the Chicago World's Fair oh, well. of 1893. So if you'd like to join us, you're very welcome. We have um, uh, an event bright set up for, for next week already, so just find it and um, so sign yourself in. We'll see some people uh, next week as well, hopefully. Good. Well, sounds like a great, great topic. Yeah, that's great. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks so much for coming. Thanks, Sophie.